So now we're in this book, all right? It's called Judicial Cases Concerning American Slavery and the Negro, edited by Helen Tunicliffe Catero, all right? Volume one, there's five volumes, this is volume one, and these are from the cases from the courts of England, Virginia, West Virginia, and Kentucky, Washington, D.C., published by the Carnegie Institution of Washington, 1926. And it says here, right in the introduction, it says, Virginia, the most interesting matter contained in the earlier part of the following body of ec extracts is found in those cases which have to do with the beginnings of Negro slavery and the end of Indian slavery. All right, so, you know, that's your own hijack right here. You know, I hope we've shown in the last several videos who they're talking about when they're talking about Indian, right? So Indians did become Negroes eventually. The census right in the paper genocide. We're going to continue to show you this, but I hope you already know that. All right, so what did they mean? The beginnings of Negro slavery and the end of Indian slavery. They just mean like a status change. Like, you know what I mean? Like, like you know, they, that, this is when they erased you. Those cases are so scanty, are involved in such obscurity and are connected with such a maze of statutes, that's what I'm just saying, it's just saying it better, right? That they require illumination before they can furnish it. The text need a commentary. And since these cases come early in the chronological order of arrangement, the first part of this introduction is of that nature. To write the history of slavery in Virginia in the 17th century is like putting together a picture puzzle when many of the pieces are missing like reconstructing a Greek vase from a few shards. Others may fit the fragments in a different fashion. You see all the trouble they go through? All right, or are they just bullshitting? The servant, all right, it says number one. So let's see what it says. The term, number one, the term servant was used to designate anyone who rendered service, the laborer as well as the household servant, all right? So that's what they mean by servant. It says problem, or rather the problem of service. In the early colonial days, they find solution, the fight solution, but necessity caused nine or ten varieties of servitor to be evolved in Virginia, most of them existing in the or other colonies also. These varieties are arranged approximately in order of social precedence were the white indentured servants, the white servants without indentures, um, who, of whom there were two classes, those who came voluntarily and those who came involuntarily, of which latter class were the men, women, and children who were spirited away, those who left their country for their country's good and probably the duty boys, the Christian Negro servants, Indian servants, mulatto servants, whose servitude was the penalty for having a white mother and an Indian Negro or mulatto father, or after 1723 for being descended in the maternal line from such a combination of ancestors. Indian slaves, Negro slaves, 
Most of these varieties existed side by side in Virginia in the 17th century. Let us hope for the sake of the owners that no one, no one plantation held them all, but the last possessed the germinal potentiality of a certain mustard seed, outstripped the rest and waxed a great tree, while the others like saplings perished in its shade. All right, so, you know, we're not done with this book. All right, we're here again. It says here, Studies in History, Economics and Public Law, edited by the Faculty of Political Science of Columbia University. And this is the title of the book, which is Indian Slavery in Colonial Times Within the Present Limits of the United States by Almond Wheeler, Lauber, Ph.D. All right, this is from Columbia University, again, 1913. So now we're in Chapter 9 of this book. It's called Property Relations, all right? Property Relations. So the practices connected with the institution of Negro and Indian slavery in the Spanish colonies were known to the English colonists, yet at first the latter did not see fit to impose the status of slavery upon the Indians brought into the colonies by way of trade with the Spanish islands or otherwise but were content to retain possession of the services of their subject Indians without taking possession of their persons through legal de declarations imposing the status of slavery upon them. All right, right away. What are they telling us? They're telling that, you know, these first English uh, colonists, when they were setting up their colonies and uh, getting or whatever they, they call trading, or whatever, but they were buying uh indians off the spanish right they were selling enslaving indians and selling them to the english colonies right i've come i've gone over this already we already know again the spanish were enslaving uh american indians uh mostly uh you know and not africans and so they were trading these with the english the english was like all right well we don't want to you know i guess as they're being politically correct here call them or declare them official slaves they just want their services, right? What they're good at, whatever they are, farming, uh, you know, you're a mechanic, whatever. You're a teacher, you, you know, foreign, whatever your service is, that's what they were employing. Because the Spanish had this almost a similar thing, even though it was basically almost slavery with how they were treating them, but they had their encomienda system, which is a type of indenture as well. And um, so, you know, the English right here, they beginning this book letting you know Again, let me just repeat that part. It says, but we're content to retain possession of the services of their subject Indians without taking possession of their persons through legal declarations imposing the status of slavery upon them. Such Indians were held in the status of servitude. Such Indians were held, your ancestors, or so-called Negroes, were held in the status of servitude, a condition which stood midway between freedom and absolute subjection. Right in between, either or, and which was the historic base upon which slavery, by the extension and addition of incidents, was constructed. Slavery was constructed based on this status of servitude between freedom and absolute subjection. It could have gone either way for you. And most of the time it went absolute subjection, or chattel slavery as they call it. All right, for life. All right, for life. The right of ownership of the services of both Negroes and Indians was, after all, what the colonists most desired and appeared to promise satisfaction in this instance, as it had in the case of the white indentured servants. Remember, there was white indentured servants, too. All right. So again, but li listen to what they're telling you. So the right of ownership of the services of both Negroes and Indians all right, Negroes and Indians, it's all the same. Indian servitude not only preceded Indian slavery. Again, Indian servitude, so-called Negro, Indian, so-called Negro servitude, not only preceded Indian or colored, right? They classified you as colored or Negro slavery, but even continued after the institution of slavery was fully developed. This is true of most, if not all, of the English American colonies, all their colonies practice this. It is certainly true of Maryland, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Pennsylvania, Georgia, North Carolina, and South Carolina. 
statutory recognition of slavery in general by the English American colonies occurred as follows. All right, so again, when they started recognizing statutory slavery, all right, so it says in Massachusetts it began in 1641, all right, by Connecticut in 1650, by Virginia in 1661 in Virginia, by Maryland in 1663, by New York and New Jersey in 1664, by South Carolina in 1682, by Pennsylvania and Rhode Island in 1700, by North Carolina 1715, and by Georgia in 1755. But the legislation of these dates did not always include the subject Indians. When such was the case, however, according to a strict legal interpretation, any subject Indian, if enslaved, had the right to demand his freedom from the colonial courts, such as an instance existed in the case of Virginia where the Acts of 1655 and 1661 specifically forbade Indian slavery and guaranteed to the subject Indians all the rights of servants. servants. The recognition of Indian as well as Negro slavery by customary law came somewhat earlier than by statute law. With the extension of the period of servitude to a life term, all right, listen to that. With the extension of a, the period of servitude to a life term, the change from servitude to slavery was practically completed so far as customary law was concerned. Ah, right, you're hearing, you're hearing what, what they did, right? Only the enactment of legal provisions sanctioning the change was necessary to complete the process. They were already practicing that. That's what they're trying to tell you. All right, so eventually they made it law. They, they, you know, they did legal provisions sanctioning the change. All right, so they can complete the process. The common use in subsequent law of the terms servant for life, perpetual servant. All right, dumb diverses. What are we talking? The, the doctrine of discovery. What are we talking about? Perpetual servitude. That's what the Pope said too. Gregorio and Alexander, perpetual servitude. Go take all their lands and kingdoms, their dukedoms, principalities. Go take all their gold. Make them perpetual servants. Dumb diverses until different. Until different. Until until we make a change, right? Again, the common use and subsequent law of the terms servant for life, perpetual servant, and bond servant as synonymous with the term slave all right they combined all those <laughs> what adjectives or descriptions or tags legal terms they had for you and they made them synonymous with slave it shows how little change was really affected in the condition of the servant so they made it in paper because they were already practicing that in life that's what they're trying to tell you such change consisted chiefly from the standpoint of the master in the extension of his right to service and consequently in the extension of his obligation of protection and maintenance and what was still more important in the acquisition of the right of possession of the offspring of his slaves now so-called slaves now all right all right so uh, real quick um i just want to show an example of what they're talking about how you know you had a contract, you know, you had a certain amount of years, you had to work as an indentured servant. And because of these uh, racist and corrupt, you know, judges and lawyers at that time, um, they were actually extending your, your contract to basically life. The life, you were serving life. Basically, you, they were turning you into a slave. All right, so I just want to show one court case here uh, from this book. And then we'll go right back to uh, Indian slavery in colonial times. All right, the book we were just reading. All right, so again, we're in the book called Judicial Cases Concerning American Slavery and the Negro. This is from cases from the courts of England, Virginia, West Virginia, and Kentucky's official document, court records, I published by the Carnegie Institution of Washington. Now, I want you to uh, look at this uh, court case, right? It says here, re, uh, Negro, John Punch. It says here, the source... This is July 1640, it says, Whereas 
Hugh Gwyn Hath brought back from Maryland three servants, formerly ran away, run away. The court thus therefore ordered that the said three servants shall receive the punishment of whipping and to have 30 stripes apiece, one called Victor. Now listen to this. Listen to the, who the three servants are. So one of them is Victor, a Dutchman, right? From Holland, a Dutchman, European. The other, a Scotchman or a Scotland, right? A person from Scotland, a Scotchman called James Gregory. So two Europeans shall first serve out their times with their master according to their indenture. So they got to serve out their punishment is to serve out their time with their master in one whole year apiece after the time of their service is expired in an extra year, I guess. And after that service to serve the colony for three whole years apiece. So after they serve their master an extra year, then they have to do another additional three years for the colony all right, as servants, indentured servants. All right. And that the third being a Negro. So the third person, which was a Negro, so-called Negro, right? American Indian named John Punch shall serve his said master or his assigns for the time of his natural life here or elsewhere. You see what's going on? What went on back then is still going on today. So the so-called Negro got life. So he's the one that got life. Why didn't he get uh, just an extra year and then three years with the colony? Why didn't he get that same sentence? Because he was a Negro, an Indian. How did he become from indentured servant to to uh, basically serving for life? He got life. Right. So out of the three of them, two of them were European. We don't know if they were uh white like white like you know white europeans or if these were you know negro europeans from this time we don't know that indian slavery in colonial times within the present limits of the united states by almond wheeler lobber from the standpoint of the slave it meant little more than the loss of the right to ultimate liberty political and civil and the extension of his right to protection and maintenance. So basically, they couldn't go to court anymore and fight for their freedom because they used to go to court all the time when their, you know, their servitude was up or they were treated, being tr treated wrong or whatever. The legislation which marked the change in status varied in nature in the several colonies. In certain colonies, the slavery status was simply recognized as being in existence by certain acts relating to slaves without any formal de declaration of the effect that Indians held in servitude should be considered slaves. In other colonies, the condition of slavery as applied to Indians was legalized by general acts relating to slavery in general and not specifying either Indians or Negroes because it's all the same. They didn't need to specify in those times. They knew it. In still other colonies, the holding of Indians in a condition of actual slavery was legalized by legislative acts relating directly to Indians. An act of this latter character was passed by New York in 1678, declaring that all Indians that should come to or be brought into the province of at any time during the succeeding six months should be sold as slaves for the benefit of the government. South Carolina in an act of 1712 relating to the better ordering and governing of Negroes and slaves, Negroes and slaves, are they adding um, Indians in there? You know they are. Provided that all Negroes, mulattoes, mestizos, or Indians, which have at any time heretofore been sold or now are held and taken to be, or hereafter shall be brought and sold as slaves, are hereby declared slaves to all intents and purposes excepting all such Negroes, mulattoes, mestizos, or Indians, which heretofore have been or hereafter shall be for some particular merit made and declared free, either by the governor and council of this province or by their respective owners and masters, and also excepting all such Negroes, mulattoes, mestizos, or Indians, as can prove they ought not to be sold as slaves." All right, so you heard that. So see how they first, they group all those tags together all the time, right? They're trying to say that, you know, only the governor, the council, and your master can, you know, let you go free. 
if you came in as a slave, then you will be considered a slave. That's what they're saying. If you came in with that status, if you can consider that. The acts already mentioned in, all, in other connections, authorizing the enslavement of Indian captives taken in war, the holding and slavery of such captives when obtained in trade from sources outside the colony and the enslavement of free Indians by the colonial authorities as punishment for misdemeanors and crimes are also cases and points. All right. From the standpoint of English law, the action of the colonial legislatures enacting the slavery status had no legal sanction. It was based on the interpretation of the common law of nations. Again, whoa, let's go back to that. You hear this? So it says, from the standpoint of English law, the a action of the colonial legislatures enacting the slavery status had no legal sanction. No legal sanction. It was based on the interpretation of the common law of nations. That is, it was carried on in accordance with a law not promulgated by legislation and rested upon prevalent views of universal jurisprudence and authority on the legal status of early American slavery states. It may be laid down as a legal axiom that in all governments in which the municipal regulations are not absolutely opposed to slavery, persons already reduced to that state may be held in it. And we also assume as a first principle that slavery had been permitted and tolerated in all the colonies established in America by European powers as relates to blacks and also as relates to Indians in the first periods of conquest and colonization. This account in a measure for the absence of any legislative act of European powers for introducing slavery into the American dominions. Hence, it followed that the English colonial charters authorizing the colonial legislatures to make laws gave no license as such to enslave. Again, you hear that? So based on what they're saying right here, this accounts and measure again for the absence of any legislative act of European powers for intruding slavery into the American dominion. So then they didn't have laws, right, to go against anything like this, right? So they were they were just creating so it's like going around the system a little bit. So it says, hence it followed that the English colonial charters authorizing the colonial legislatures to make laws gave no license as such to enslave. All right, we're still in the book, Indian Slavery in Colonial Times Within the Present Limits of the United States. And it says here, with the change from the status of servitude to the status of slavery, certain of the attributes of the former condition were continued and connected with the latter chief of these and the fundamental idea on which the change was affected was the conception of property right which from the idea of the ownership of an individual's service resting upon contract implied or expressed came to be that of the ownership of an individual's person indian slaves were recognized as property in all english colonies and were openly bought and sold at both public and private sales, like Negroes and other property. Again, Indian slaves were recognized as property in all the English colonies. All right. So, you know, all those images we get, you know, growing up of so-called Negroes, you know, only so-called Negroes or whatever we think is a Negro or whatever we, th we, th we think is an Indian. Right. They never tell us, you know, that they were being sold both in public and private sales, just like Negroes, as it says here, and other property, the same people. They were advertised in the colonial newspapers with statements of their qualifications and ability for work, their ages, and sometimes descriptions of their personal appearance. From the New England newspapers, it is apparent that for a time, dealers advertised such slaves for sale openly in their own names. Later, the possible purchaser was directed by the advertisement to inquire of the printer and no further, or to inquire at the post office. It was not uncommon for slaves offered for sale to choose their future owner from those who desired to purchase them or to approve the bill of sale. Huh. You hear that? You got to choose your owner, your master. Like other property, real or personal, Indian slaves could be given away by word of mouth or by last will and testament. One of the earliest of such wills on record is that of Governor John Winthrop of Massachusetts, John Winthrop, made in 1639, by which he gave to his son Adam 
governor's island and with it also my indians there on all right his indians that's who he had as as servants or slaves i right? or property not uh what you call africans right he had indians in south carolina where indian slaves were most numerous the records of their disposal by will are frequent i right? most numerous in south carolina The custom, in fact, was universal in the colonies. It was universal throughout the colonies. Indian slaves were listed in the various colonies in the inventories of the state, along with indentured servants of unexpired terms and Negro slaves. They were taken like other chattel in payment for debt. And in certain of the colonies, provision was made by law regarding the matter. South Carolina, February 7, 1690. Decreed that a slave was to be taken like any other chattel as payment for debt. Maryland in 1729 passed an act to the effect that no slave should be taken for any debt due from the deceased so long as there should be any other goods sufficient for the purpose. In those colonies where legislation makes no mention of the matter, it is known from the history of Negro slavery that the custom was similar to that of Carolina. The proximity of the Indian tribes to the colonists, furthermore, afforded a condition most suitable for the escape of Indian slaves. Individual testimony, frequent advertisements in the colonial newspapers, given descriptions of fugitive Indian slaves and offering rewards for their capture and return and the amount of colonial legislation concerning both negro and indian runaway slaves showed that indians held in servitude took frequent advantage of the opportunities at hand for their escape we've gone over this right in the last video how and we've seen shown i've shown you advertisements from those times show, talking about uh the indian negro of the indian breed or negro with long hair bright yellow negro right like these are indians now it says here and that their owners used all possible means to regain their lost property at the time following the pequit war mason complained of the tendency to run away shown by the pequit slaves in the colonies The Indians enslaved after King Philip's war likewise escaped. Mayhew tells of runaway Indian slaves in Massachusetts in 1690. In this same year, one Isaac Morrill of New Jersey was arrested at Newbury, Massachusetts for an enticing Indian and Negro slaves to run away. The Boston News Letter came into existence in 1704 at about the time when Indian slaves began to be brought into the northern colonies from the spanish islands and from the carolinas what who indian slaves not africans indians in 1704 this is way after 1619 right so-called uh first africans right we're going to talk about all that all right but since the existence of 1704 right this is during the time that they were receiving indian slaves from the spanish islands and from the Carolinas. Rarely was there an issue of that or the other Massachusetts newspapers. From that time down to the revolutionary period, which did not contain an advertisement for a runaway Indian slaves. This is all about you, so-called Negroes. It's all the same people. Sometimes the same advertisement was repeated in two or three successive issues and was often inserted in more than one newspaper. For the capture and return of the fugitives, rewards were offered, sometimes indefinite in nature as suitable rewards, sometimes of stated amounts of three pounds, 40 shillings, 20 shillings, six pounds, 20 pounds, five pounds, seven pounds, 15 pounds, four pistoles, 50 shillings. These advertisements relate for the most part to fugitive men and boy Indian slaves, but advertisements relating to runaway women, Indian slaves are not lacking. The escapees appear for the most part, though not always to have been made singly. One advertisement shows two Indian men, two Indian women, and an Indian boy belonging to a different person to have escaped together. Captains of vessels were often cautioned in the advertisements against carrying away such fugitives, slaves, and any person harboring them 
or aiding them to escape was threatened with full penalty of the law. All the colonies enacted fugitive slave laws. Some of these laws were applied to slaves in general, some to Negroes and other slaves, still others to Negro, Mulatto, and Indian slaves. The colonies where slavery was of greatest extent had the most extensive and elaborate laws on the subject. In those colonies where Indian slavery existed to any considerable extent included the term Indian slaves in their laws. Pennsylvania made but little provision regarding runaway slaves. Maryland concerned itself more largely with servants. Some of these laws did not define the term runaway slave. Others, in an attempt to avoid confusion, gave clear explanations of the term. Such an act was passed by Con Connecticut in 1690, specifying that in any Indian, mulatto, or Negro servant and slaves wandering outside the place to which they belong without a ticket or leave or pass in writing from some assistant or justice of the peace or from their owner were to be considered runaways and treated as such. New Jersey in 1713 considered as runaways any Negro, mulatto, or Indian slave who was five miles from his master's habitation without written leave of absence from his owner, and any such slave found in New Jersey, but belonging to another province was declared a runaway. South Carolina, by the Act of 1690, considered as a runaway any Negro or Indian slave absent from his master's plantation, no distance specified, without a written ticket of leave unless, unless in company with a white man. To discourage aid and assistance being given fugitive slaves, the colony specified by legislative acts that punishment to follow such offense on June 14, 1705, Lord Cornberry, in his opening speech to the New York Assembly, expressed his opinion regarding the necessity for passing an act to prevent Negro, Indian, and mulatto slaves running away from their masters. An act of the Common Council of Albany, 1686, forbade all persons harboring Negro or Indian slaves in their houses without the owner's consent. Pennsylvania, 1726, decreed a fine of five shillings for the first hour and one shilling for every hour afterwards that any person should harbor or entertain any runaway Negro, Indian, or mulatto slave. Virginia, by the Act of 1705, specified a fine of a hundred pounds for any shipmaster transporting any Negro, mulatto, or Indian slave out of the colony without permission of the owner. All right, so do you see how they always just group in Negro, mulatto, and Indian? All together, they keep mentioning, you see, so it was all, but these three are all the same people. They were calling the Indians mulatto and Negro in census records. They would change that. We know that, right? The so South Carolina also, by an act of 1690, levied four, 40 shillings fine on anyone not attempting to apprehend a Negro or Indian slave coming into his plantation without a ticket or of leave from his master or not accompanied by a white man. Not infrequently, the colonial authorities were called upon to furnish protection to the owners of Indian slaves against their seizure by the free Indians or against fugitive Indian slaves being hidden and retained by the tribes. To effect the return of such slaves, special inducements were offered by the colonial government from time to time at the close of the Pequot War an agreement was made by the chief Mayan Tonomo and the Massachusetts government by which the former promised to see such Pequot slaves as escaped and returned them to their owners. All right, so we're still in the book Indian Slavery in Colonial Times within the present limits of the United States. And it says here, with the growth of the idea of property incident to the slavery status, the early transition of the slave from personal estate to a chattel real or real estate with a company, accompanying incidents was easy and natural. Under the caption of property, both Negro and Indian slaves were subject to taxation like other property, either for colonial revenue in general or to meet the local expenses. Moreover, in certain colonies, both Indian and Negro slaves were assigned the double character of persons subject to a poll tax and property subject to a property tax. All right, you hear that? South Carolina, in the Act of 1690, provided that all slaves, as to the payment of debts, shall be deemed and taken as all other goods and chattels, 
and all Negroes and slaves shall be accounted as freehold in all other cases whatsoever and descend accordingly. Middleton, president of the council, consequently declared in 1725 that Negroes were real property, such as houses and lands in Carolina. Yet they were always returned as personal property in the inventories of interstates. This condition continued until 1740, when it was declared that Negroes and Indian slaves should be reputed and adjudged in law to be chattels personal in the hands of their owners and possessors and their executors, administers, and assigns. Various tax acts were passed from time to time for special reasons, and in some of these Indian slaves, along with Negroes, were a part of the basis of taxation being rated as property without specification as to real or personal, along with goods, lands, cattle, and white servants. Such an act was passed in 1703. The act contained the general term slaves, which of course included Indian slaves by implication, all right? A tax on poles was generally selected by the colonies as the chief source of revenue. In accordance with this idea of taxation, North Carolina during the 18th century regarded Indian slaves as taxables. In the earliest legislative action of the colony, taxables were declared to be every white male aged 16 years and every slave, Negro, mulatto, or Indian male or female aged 12 years. By the Act of 1750, furthermore, a taxable was every white man of 16 years of age, every Negro, mulatto, or musty and every other person of mixed blood to the fourth generation, 12 years of age. In 1682, the gradual process of change from the status of Indian servitude to that of Indian slavery was completed. The Virginia Act of 1670 had declared a condition of slavery for all Indians imported into the colony by sea, but the great body of subject Indians were natives of the country. Such Indians remained servants up to 1676, when at the beginning of the Indian War, one of the Bacon's laws made all Indian captives slaves. In 1682, slavery was extended to captives sold by tributary Indians in the hope of mitigating their condition as it was certain that they would be held in slavery by their captors. These acts did not make provision for changing the condition of Indian servants that existed in the colony before 1670. Su such a change had come about through a gradual and natural process, with the passage of the laws mentioned and the changed attitude towards the subject Indians, so that in fact all subject Indians were not considered slaves. Hence, in 1682, all Indian slaves were considered in law as persons inasmuch as they were titables or like taxable. By 1705, it was found necessary for legal purposes to advance the property notion of the slave from personality to realty. Though certain incidents of the personality were still retained, the statute of that year by which the change was effected provided that in the future all Negro, Mulatto, or Indian slaves in all courts of jurisdiction and other places within this dominion shall be held, taken, and adjudged to be real estate and not chattels. As a part of the real estate property, slaves were subject to taxation. An act of 1748 again made slaves personal estate, but was repealed by the king, October 31st, 1751. By the act of 1779 and 1781, slaves were still liable to a poll tax of five pounds and 10 pounds, respectively to be paid by the owner. So it may be seen that from 1649 until after the revolutionary revolution, Indian servants and slaves, either as persons or as property, were used as a basis for taxation in Virginia. All right, back in the book, Judicial Cases Concerning American Slavery and the Negro. And it says here, however, the colonists did not depend on traffic or kidnapping for their supply of Indian slaves, but took the enemy pagan by their own prow prowess in war and enslaved him long before the passage of the Virginia Acts of 1676 and 1679. When forces were being raised in Maryland in 1652 for a march against the Eastern Shore Indians, such Indian prisoners as shall happen to be taken are declared to the spoil of those who finance the expedition. Indians were also reduced to slavery and punishment for crime. Thus, we have shown that the first slaves in the colony of Virginia, all right, listen, the first slaves or servants 
indentured servitude, right? In the colony of Virginia were Indians, not Negroes, so-called Negroes, Indians, and that the laws of the colony sanctioned Indian slavery except as regard prospective importations by land. For a few years after the passage of the Act of 1670, the practice of the colonists in accordance with their laws is illustrated by cases in the courts of Virginia and Maryland. From 1627 to 1831 and 1627, some Indians of the Car Carib Islands, some Indians of the Carib Islands were brought into the country, Virginia, in 1627 by Captain Sampson, but the experiment was too disastrous to warrant repetition, at least on a wholesale scale. All right, Carib Indians. That Indians were brought in and held in slavery for many years subsequent to 1682 is indicated by the evidence of witnesses and the assertions of counsel in cases brought forth 90 to 150 years later, and by acts passed in the 18th century. Robin and others who brought actions in 1772 to try their titles to freedom were descendants of Indian women brought into this country by traders at several times between the years 1682 and 1748 and by them sold as slaves under the Act of Assembly made in 1682. Mason counsel for the plaintiffs asserts that hundreds of the descendants of Indians, hundreds, brought in between 1682 and 1684 have obtained their freedom on actions brought in this court. In the case of Henry in June 1772, the court gave judgment against many descendants of Indians introduced and held as slaves between 1682 and 1705. That many Indians were reduced to slavery between 1691 and 1705 is shown by Henning's assertion that thousands of their descendants were deprived of their liberty when they sued for it later on. In the revisal of the laws in 1705, an act concerning servants and slaves reenacts chapter 1 of the Act of 1682 in substance but omits the word Indian. All right, so now they omit the Indian, right? They're about to change it. All right, and the special clauses respecting Indian slaves. The facts disclosed in these cases show that Indians continued to be brought in as slaves during the early part of the 18th century and an act of assembly 1723 indicates that the legislature of that time did not consider that Indian slavery was distinguished by the act of 1705. It was enacted that no Negro, mulatto, or Indian slaves shall be set free. See how they group them together? Except for some meritorious services. Now listen to this. As the child of an Indian was deemed a mulatto, so the child of an Indian was deemed mulatto automatically. As the child of an Indian was deemed mulatto, don't you have mulatto in your ancestors' census records? As the child of an Indian was deemed a mulatto, they would have been before 1705 if that act forbade enslavement of Indians thereafter. The actual practice as shown by the cases which came before the courts proves that the act of 1705 was not regarded as the palladium of Indian liberty till some 65 or 75 years after its passage. It must, of course, be kept in mind that the Indian ancestresses on whom the suits for freedom were based in all these cases had been theoretically and perhaps actually members of hostile tribes. The friendly Indian was on an altogether different plane. All right? The colonists made his temporal and spiritual welfare the subject of their paternalistic legislation and benefits, benefits the French pagans as they were called in Maryland in this distinction from enemy pagans, might come to the colonists as hostages in exchange for the English hostages, might be employed as servants, the male Indians being particularly useful in ecking out the food supply by the hunting and fishing, or might be brought in as children by their parents to be instructed in the Christian religion. All right, so these good uh, uh, friend pagans, as they call them, the good Indians to them because they did treaties with them, so the bad Indians, right, the enemy pagans, regarding what we were just talking about, a reading, it says here, 112, in the early colonial days, hostile Indians were all who were not friendly. By 1682, the friendly Indians are called neighboring Indians, confederates, or tributaries. The distance of the hostile Indians from the settlement is an important 
element of his hostility. His foreign quality is emphasized and he is definitely located outside the North American continent by the court in Coleman versus Pat. In 1793, which held that though no American Indian could be reduced to slavery since the act of 1705, foreign Indians, listen to this, foreign Indians, we're not talking about Africans or now they're not calling them Negroes, right? Foreign Indians coming within the description of that act might be made slaves, but the foreign ones, we can enslave them. Let's enslave them. Let's call them Negroes. But the term is used in the Act of 1705, Chapter 52, Section 2, to designate non-tributary American Indians who are approachable by land for the tributary Indians are required to march with the English in pursuit of foreign Indians. You hear that? I didn't, I wasn't look, looking, I wasn't going to read this, but look at this, 113, infidel was the general term for Indian in Virginia. Who they call infidels? Indians. Who are they baptizing? Infidels, right? Indians. So these people they were bringing up, remember, Antonio, Maria, Eduardo, Pedro, right? These were Indians. They had baptized, given Christian names. Judicial cases concerning American slavery and the Negro. It says here in March 1662, it is enacted that what Englishman trader or other shall bring in any Indians as servants and shall assign them over to any other shall not sell them as slaves, nor for any longer time than English of the like ages shall serve by the act of assembly. This act of 1662 definitely fixes the status of Indians brought in as servants. They are to be no worse off than the indentured English servants, all right? The same as, you know, the English servant. They are to be no worse of the like ages. The class of Indian servants received an ascension to their ranks by the Act of 1670, which provided that Indian captives sold to the English by the nation that takes them should also be servants for a term, though a much longer term than the Indian servants from friendly tribes. So the Acts of 1676, 1679, and 1682 co-signed such captives thereafter to slavery. The supply of servants of Indian blood was continued in a steady stream by Acts of 1691 and of 1723. By the former, the bastard child of a white mother and an Indian father is to be bound out as a servant until he shall attain the age of 30 years. By the latter, the bastard child of a white woman and an Indian or a Negro or mulatto, listen to this, an Indian, parentheses, or a Negro or mulatto, same thing, right? That's what we're talking about. They're letting you know. Had not only to pay for the sins of its parents by serving 30 years, but the sins were visited on the next generation, where any female mulatto or Indian any female mulatto or Indian, same thing, by law obliged to serve till the age of 30 or 31 years, shall during the time of her servitude have any child born of her body, every child shall serve the master of such mulatto or Indian, mulatto or Indian, until it shall attain the same age the mother of such child was obliged by law to serve unto. All right, again, we're in the book, A History of Slavery in Virginia. This is written by the John Hopkins University. All right, so this is uh, chapter two in this book, and it's called Development of Slavery. All right, the development of slavery. Legal status of the slave. The creation of legal sta status is dependent locally upon either customary or statutory law. And in the case of organized society, usually upon both. Though the practice and incidence of Negro and Indian slavery in the Spanish colonies, same people, were perfectly familiar to the people of Virginia. For some reason, the notion of enslavement gained ground but slowly, and although the conditions surrounding a Negro or Indian in possession could easily make him a de facto slave. So even though because of the way they were treating them and living, you know, you can basically consider them slaves, but the colonist seems to have preferred to retain him only as a servant. The colonist seems to have preferred to retain him only as a servant, not a slave. 
This was largely the result of the development institution of servitude. The institution of servitude indentured servants, which in the early years of the 17th century adequately met the economic demands of colonial society and for social and moral reasons was preferable to any system of slavery and particularly to that of Negroes and Indians. Again, and particularly to that of Negroes and Indians. All right. It was preferred more indentured servitude. The primary steps in the institutional development which culminated in slavery are then to be found in the legislation, customary and statutory, that defined that condition of persons legally known as servitude. All right, they're telling you right now, John Hopkins University book, Political Science and History. The primary steps in the institutional development, which culminated in slavery, all right, what basically created slavery, are then to be found in the legislation. You can find it in the legislation, in the customary and statutory, and all these laws, all these codes that define that conditions of persons legally known as servitude or servants, indentured servants. This is how it began. Servitude not only preceded slavery. It preceded slavery in the logical development of the principle of subjection, standing midway between freedom and absolute subjection. We already got this in the other book, right? Between. So you were in between. So they were playing games, basically. They knew this. They can stretch it either way, anytime they wanted to. Either they can put you in absolute subjection at some point or let you go free. But it was the historic base upon which slavery by the extension and addition of incidents was constructed all right it was constructed slavery was constructed based of indentured servitude developed itself from a species of free contract labor from free contract labor contract by the peculiar conditions surrounding the importation of settlers and laborers into the english american colonies servitude was first applied to whites and then to Negroes and Indians. All right, so whites were there too. Whites, wits, whites. It began to receive leg legal definition as soon as colonial law became operative in 1619, at the very time that the first importation of Negroes were made, at the same time the so-called first African so-called slaves arrived. This began at the same time. It was but natural then that they should be absorbed in a growing system which spread to all the colonies and for nearly a century furnished the chief supply of colonial labor. Negro and Indian servitude thus preceded Negro and Indian slavery and together with white servitude and instances continued even after the institution of slavery was fully developed. All right. Virginia was not the only colony in which servitude bore this direct relation to slavery as its prepar preparatory stage or form. Negro and Indian servitude passed historically into slavery in most of the English American colonies, if not in all. Okay? This is certainly true of Maryland, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Pennsylvania, Georgia, North Carolina, and South Carolina. In all these colonies, statutory recognition of slavery, though tending to be anticipated by customary or judicial sanction, was postponed for something after the introduction of the subjects of slavery, who were consequently referred to a different status. Most of the incidents developed in servitude were passed on to slavery. Again, most of the incidents developed in servitude were passed on to slavery. Some of them modified and amplified to conform to the changed relations. But the numerous acts on the statute books applying equally to servants and slaves show that similarity and very essential connection of the two institutions continued while they existed by, side by side. The period of the chief legal development of servitude was naturally prior to the recognition of slavery. 
naturally prior to the recognition of slavery. But even after the transition to slavery, so there was a transition. Look what they're telling you. Look what they we're reading here, right? This is not my opinions. It's all you static out there, having tantrums all the time, leaving un invaluable comments on the videos. As you can see, I'm reading from historical primary sources. All the information in this book I'm reading from right now, right, is backed up by so many scholarly original sources. I mean, just go to the footnotes, Google this yourself. Again, a history of slavery in Virginia. Now, we're going to go back. It says, but even after the transition, transition to slavery had been affected. And through the whole time, uh, two institutions were coexistent. That is, for more than a century in Virginia, Massachusetts, Maryland, and Connecticut, and for long periods in other colonies, the reciprocal influence of the one on the other was marked. The general effect of this relation is to be seen in the gradual hardening of the conditions of servitude, hardening and mitigation of those of slavery, so that the form finally assumed by slavery was of a milder type than ancient, medieval, or even contemporary forms of that institution. While the line between servitude and slavery tended constantly towards obliteration.